chapter 5. Open your Bibles, please, to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. All righty, and we are going to start reading in verse number one, Ephesians chapter number five, and uh, we'll start reading in verse number number one. Once you found Ephesians chapter five, would you say amen, please? Is that everybody? All right, look at verse number one, Ephes <laughs> Ephesians chapter five. And look down at verse number one. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of, and here it is, these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. All right, in verse number six, that's my key verse of this passage. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. So this is these things, part number 28. We're going to talk about walk not in these things. We're going to talk about walk not in these things. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. I love you, Jesus, and I am so grateful for all that you do for us. Father, please help us now. And I pray, dear Lord, that you'll please do something real in our midst, in our hearts, and in our lives. Holy Spirit of God, I yield myself to you. Please help me as I preach to have the power of God. Help me uh, to have the mind of Christ. And Father, I pray, dear Lord, that every word that is said from behind this pulpit this evening will be honoring and pleasing in your sight. And I pray for every person here to have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. Father, help us all to be attentive and paying attention to the Holy Spirit of God. Help us to respond with obedience and to do exactly what you want us to do. Bless those who are watching online. We'll give you all the glory now. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, walk not in these things. Okay, so for the first 27 weeks, we have discussed things that God wants us to do. And if we do certain things, then God will respond in like manner. You know, we've talked about in the, the first passage, I think it was Second Peter chapter 1, where we learned that if we do these things, we'll never fall. And that's a great, great promise from the, from the Word of God. And uh, there were seven things that were mentioned, um, and, and we discussed it. You know, we'll never fall. We'll, we'll, we'll always, you know, know the will of God. We will not forget that we've had victory over sin and just other promises that were in Second Peter chapter 1. Then we went over to Psalm chapter 15, and we took some time and learned there were, uh, I think, 11 things that God says, if you want to be close to God and if you want to never be moved as a Christian, then there were 11 things that we learned from Psalm 15. Then we went over to Romans chapter 14, and we learned that there were three things that if we did them, then we would be, first of all, acceptable to God, and then secondly, approved by men. And that was a blessing, learning those three things. And then last week, we jumped over to Romans chapter 8 and Acts chapter 20, and we found out that in these things, and there was, I think, uh, 17 things that were mentioned, or 13 things, something like that, in these things of, of life, we are more than conquerors. And so we learned that even though these things come to us, you know, we can still conquer as Christians. And so that's what we learned last week. Now, for part number 28, we're going we're gonna to study 
line upon line, precept upon precept, and we're going to dissect and define the words and the phrases, and we're going to learn that God says that we should not walk in these things. There are six of them, and we're going to give you all six of them tonight. So now we see God telling us not to do these things as we live the Christian life. Now, by way of introduction, I'm going to give you six thoughts, okay? Look down, if you would, please, at verse number one of Ephesians chapter number five, okay? So look down, if you would, please, at verse number one. It says this, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Okay, so by way of introduction, what is God saying to us? First of all, letter A, be followers of God, all right? Be followers of God. Now, this is the premise of the whole Christian life. Why did you get saved? Did you just get saved to escape the fires of hell? Now, obviously, that's a motivation that, uh, of people that why they get saved, right? They don't want to go to hell. But is that all? I mean, is that the extent of your belief in Jesus and your relationship to him? Well, it shouldn't be. So here's what God says, you know, be ye followers of God. Now look what it says, though, as dear children. You know what's amazing about families? When a child is born and as a child grows up in a, in a family, in a home, they admire mom and dad. They do. All children want to be like their parents. They all do. I remember all of my boys, I think every single one of them, when they were young, like four, five, six years of age or whatever, you know, they'd be preaching in our living room, you know? I mean, I remember one time my wife took a video of Jack. He had a makeshift pulpit, makeshift uh, pulpit and um, he had one of those toy microphones that, you know, amplified a voice and stuff. And he was just preaching to the stuffed animals or whatever, you know, that he had there. And uh, every, every child does. I remember when David was a young boy, uh, I don't know, 10, 11 years of age or so, the, um, the uh, lawnmower was not working properly. And uh, I was out at the church or soul winning or something, and he called me and said, Dad, come fix this. This ain't working, you know. And he's trying to mow the lawn for his mom. And so I came home, and within just a couple of minutes, I got it running. And I'll never, it's kind of funny how your mind works, how certain things about life you just don't forget. But I remember he ran through the front door and said, Mom, Mom, Dad fixed the lawnmower. I knew it. He could fix anything. And that's what he said to his mom. He was probably 10 or 11 years of age at that time, uh, maybe nine. I can't remember when we started letting him mow the lawn and stuff. But nonetheless, you know, the, all dear children, they, they have it in their heart to follow their dad, to follow their mom, to have admiration and love for their mom and dad. And so God says to us, now, as they get older, life corrupts them. They become teenagers, and they become a completely different person, you know. And uh, I remember, was it Mark Twain that said, um, every child should be uh, put in a box uh, at an early age, and when they become 13, uh, a box with a hole in it uh, so they can breathe, and when they turn 13, plug the hole. But at any rate, uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is, unfortunately, uh, often children do not stay as dear children. Often they don't. And that's a sad depiction of our society, of our culture, of our world in which we live. You know, the longer I live, the more I hate this world. And I wish we could just sort of go home. I wish the rapture would take place tonight. You know, I am ready. I'm ready to go to heaven. You know, I, I'm not going to inst inst uh not instigate it. Uh, I guess that's the right word. I'm not going to instigate me going home, but if the rapture took place tonight, I'd be very happy. I, I'm sick of this world. I really am. All the pain and heartache and the evil that's in this world. So every child starts out as dear children, and they all have admiration and love for their mom and their dad, specifically their dad. I mean, specifically, um, uh, you know, football players, 350 pound football players, you know, they're on the sideline and it used to be years ago, they would turn the camera on them and they'd say, hi, mom. You know, they never said hi, dad. So there's that love relationship with the mother that never goes away, that just never, ever, ever goes away. And there's something about a, a child, especially a boy child that wants to protect mom all throughout her life, you know, and his life and such. But, but that admiration of dad 
It's like a dear child thing. And the Bible says, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Hey, you know God's your heavenly father? Do you have admiration in your heart for him? You see, if you did, like a little child, a dear child does for his dad, that means you would want to grow up and be like your heavenly father. You'd want to grow as a Christian. And that's really the premise of this whole passage. Ephesians chapter 5, it just starts right off. Verse 1, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. So that's letter A. Letter B, look at verse 2. It says, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. So the first thing, by way of introduction, is we discuss walk not in these things. God says, letter A, be followers of God. Letter B, write this down, walk in love. Listen, if we would start loving each other instead of having hatred, anger, bitterness, strife, you know, it's amazing to me how many Christians that I've known over the years that I've been pastoring this church, that they allow hatred, anger, bitterness, strife to reside in their heart. And you know what? When they have that anger, hatred, bitterness, strife in their heart, it causes them not to get along with people. It causes them not to respect authority. You know, your pastor is the authority figure of this church. Anytime that we have animosity between a church member and a pastor, And I'm talking about if all things being equal, if I'm right with God, if we're going in the right direction and I'm just leading the church. If there's animosity, it's it's because we're not walking in love. If you have animosity in your home, between siblings, between parents, between children, whatever, it's because somebody's not walking in love. You know what the Bible says about love? It is the fulfillment of the law. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, the entire law hangs on loving God and loving others. And so here's what God says in Ephesians chapter 5. Before we get to these things that he tells us don't walk in these things, he says be followers of God as dear children, and then he says walk in love. Do you really love people in this church? I mean, literally, do you love people or do you not care? You know, if you don't care about people, you know, you could be rude to them. You could be abrasive to them. You could just not care what they think or about their feelings. You're just going to do your thing and and just whatever it is that you have an agenda, whatever it is that you want to do. Now, your agenda may not be sinful. I'm not trying to say that. But I'm saying, you know, if you walked in love, you would genuinely care about every single person that's in this church. You would care about people in the community that are unsaved by wanting them to be saved. If you would walk in love, it would transform your life. And so in Ephesians chapter 5, he says, Be followers of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ loved us. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it says, Let no man deceive you with vain words. So letter C, write this down. Be not deceived with vain words. You know, you have heard me made reference to all of these people on social media that are calling themselves recovering fundamentalists, people who are raised in a church like this and taught the ways of God from the King James Bible, and now that they're adults, they resent it, they reject it, they either have now become full-blown atheists or they go to a church that's lukewarm and more representative of the Laodicean church, and, and they, 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 they hate it. But here's what they do. They use vain words to deceive people. They say things like, God doesn't care what you wear. The music you listen to, it's, it's not as bad, bad as what they, you know, the preachers have made it out to be. They, they talk, you know, you know, homosexuals, they're fine. They're good people. They just choose to, uh, you shouldn't tell people what they, they, what they should do behind the doors of their own bedroom. You know, they go on to say things like that. Tithing, oh, tithing. This is not the generation, the age of tithing. Church, you don't have to go. You don't have to dress up, wear a tie. Go to church in your flip-flops and shorts and just sort of dress down. It's all good. Just and don't go to church if you don't want to, you know. I mean, they have all of these vain words. They hate standards and convictions. Anybody that has standards and convictions that's higher than them, You know, they hate it, especially when it comes to alcohol. Good grief. Man, they get mad. They get their feathers ruffled. If a preacher ever stands up front of the pulpit and says, don't ever drink not even one drop of alcohol, 
boy, do they get mad. I mean, these, these recovering fundamentalists, you know, it's insane. But here's what they do. They use vain words to deceive the hearts of those who listen to them. So God says in verse 6, be not deceived with vain words. We're going to discuss in just a moment six things that God says don't walk in these. And yet the, there are people that are Christian, saved people that use vain words to try to tell you these six things are not that bad and that you can go ahead and live in them and they'll all be okay. You ever heard someone say, this is the age of grace, we're not under the law? Again, that's vain words. That's what it is. The law's never been done away with. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Are you a follower of Christ? Then you should not want to destroy the law. You should want to fulfill it like Jesus said he did. Now, obviously, he was the fulfillment as far as the sacrifice for our sins. But he never talked that down about the law. He never said the law is invalid. In fact, all through the New Testament, I could show you verses that say the law is spiritual, the law is good, the law is right, the law is holy. This is all in the New Testament where God reflects that. So at any rate, don't let people use vain words to try to tell you these six things are not bad. Don't be deceived like the devil deceived Eve. Now, look at verse number six again. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Now, as we look at this introductory thought, as we prepare our mind for these six things, God says, be followers of God, walk in love, be not deceived with vain words, and then letter D, write this down. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the unsaved and the ungodly. Because of these things that we're going to discuss God is pouring out his wrath on the ungodly and the unsaved. That's what's the phrase, the children of disobedience. Thank God you and I are not called by God the children of disobedience. You know, the Bible talks about when Jesus says, ye are of your father, the devil. Thank God we're not of the, the, the devil's not our father. I mean, thank God. If you're saved, God's your father. Amen? And if you're saved, you at the very least obeyed the gospel and you are not classified in the mind of God as the children of disobedience. So what does God think about the children of disobedience, the unsaved and the ungodly? What does he think about them when they participate in these six things? He says he's going to pour his wrath out on them. So that's God's attitude toward these six things. Now watch this. Look down now at verse 7. It says, be not ye therefore partakers with them. All right, letter E, write this down by way of introduction. Be not partakers with them. Be not partakers with them. All right, so watch this carefully. God is pouring out his wrath on the children of disobedience because of these six things. So God says, don't you partake in what they're doing. Don't you partake in those things so that the wrath of God comes on you too. The wrath of God was never intended for you. You ever heard the expression, in Psalms, my cup runneth over? Well, that's the same thing in this area. The wrath of God is poured out on the children of disobedience, but it overflows. And if you're doing these six things like they're doing it, then that wrath of God can overflow on you. Now, it never was intended for you, but you can be affected by it if you partake in these six things. So God says, be not ye therefore partakers with them. And then the last thing, look back at verse 5. It says, for this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. All right, so watch this, letter F. Write this down if you're taking notes. If ye do these things, you will not receive an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God for the most part, for the most part, not, not entirely, but for the most part, it's referring to the thousand-year reign of Christ. When Jesus comes back to earth and he sets up his thousand-year reign of Christ. There's verses in the New Testament where Jesus said, you have been faithful over little, I'll make thee ruler over much. 
enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Um, there's verses where a man had five talents. He traded it and got ten talents for his Lord. He said, you are faithful. Over, I'll make you ruler over ten cities. The one that had two talents turned it into four talents. He said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'll make you ruler over four cities. All right, that's all in reference to the millennial reign of Christ, the thousand-year reign of Christ. Now, it does have an effect, a rippling effect, going forward into eternity future, which God doesn't give us a great deal about of knowledge. He doesn't go into a lot of explanation. But here's what I will tell you this. When the kingdom of God is initially set up, if you live in these six things we're going to discuss, you will not get an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So this is a big deal. This is a big deal. So the introductory thought that we're going to discuss just one last time, and then we're going to get into these six things for the main course of the meal. Amen. Uh, th th this is appetizer. That's what introduction is, appetizer. All right, here we go. Letter A, be not followers of God. Letter, I mean, be followers of God. Letter B, walk in love. So we're supposed to follow God as dear children. Then we're supposed to walk in love. Then don't be deceived with vain words. All these people that use these vain words. Would you listen to your preacher and not these stupid people on the internet? I mean that. A bunch, there's someone who has not, never led you to Christ, never prayed for you, doesn't know your name, doesn't care about you as a person individually, and yet they're going to spout something off on a YouTube sermon or internet sermon or whatever, and then you're going to believe them over your preacher who does love you, who did lead you to Christ in many cases, who did, does know you by name and does pray for you and is there for you and has helped you. Don't listen to these dumb people that have all these vain words. Don't let them deceive you. Number four, or letter D, because of these things, the wrath of God comes on the unsaved and ungodly. Then letter E, be not partakers with them. And letter E, if you do these things, you will not receive an inheritance in the kingdom of, of God. All right, what are the six things in this passage that God says do not walk in these things? All right, look down at verse number three. Now this is the, the outline. Look at verse three. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not once be named among you as becometh saints. All right, number one, write down the word fornication. The word fornication. Let me, I'm going to give you a definition for all six of these things so you understand very clearly what God is talking about. You ready? Fornication is any sexual sins. It's sensual appetites outside of the bonds of marriage. Okay? Fornication. Any sexual sins, it is sensual appetites that you indulge in outside of marriage. So here's the thing. All right? If you're not married right now and you fornicate, you have indulged in sensual appetites outside of marriage you're not even married yet right so you you don't want to fornicate and then once a person does get married right then that's where it becomes adultery and that's uh, that's a sexual sin that is only uh, it, it's an act a, a sensual act that's only intended for your spouse and you and yet you participate with it in it with someone outside of your marriage, right? So then that, that's where adultery comes into play. Now, the fact of the matter is fornication is any sexual sins. It's a sensual appetite that you indulge in outside of the bonds of marriage. Now, here's what God says, ready? Let it not be once named among you. You know what that means? Now that you're saved, you're a saint, you're going to heaven, don't even participate in fornication one time. Let it not be once named among you. This is who I am. I'm a fornicator. No, God says not even one time. Don't let it be named among you. Now, let me give you three other references when it comes to fornication so you can understand God's attitude about it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, please. 1 Corinthians chapter number, number 6. 
And if you would, look down at verse number 12, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to read verses 12 through 20. We're going to read what God has to say in the entirety of the context of this passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse number 12. Paul is writing, and he's writing to the church at Corinth, by the way, which was a very carnal, sensual church. And here's what he says in verse number 12. It says this, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now, the body, now, now he's shifting a little bit here. The body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Are you listening? I'm telling you something. Your body houses the Holy Spirit. Your body is the temple of God if you're saved. Now, I'm going to tell you the biggest problem with fornication. You think your body, but people think their body belongs to them. And they're going to do with their body what makes them feel good. And that's where fornication comes into play. But you know what God says? Your body does not belong to you. It belongs to God. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He bought you when he saved you. And it says, flee fornication. He says, if you commit fornication, you sin against your body. And then he says, um, your, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It says, glorify God in your body. So take your body and use it for God. Don't let your body be used for fornication. The number one reason why people think it's okay to fornicate any sexual sin, any, is because they think their body belongs to them. And they're going to do what makes them feel good. That's what they do. But this verse, this passage in 1 Corinthians 6 is clear. Your body is not your own. You belong to God. So flee fornication. Then look over now at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. And let's look down, if you would please, at verses 3 through 7. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Y'all glad to be here this evening? All right, thank you, two of you. I know you can't flip through the pages and say amen at the same time. I know. It's like walking and chewing gum at the same time. Some of us have a problem with that. I know. First Thessalonians chapter 4. And you say, well, I'm not happy to be here. Well, then get right with God tonight. <laughs> Don't sit there and tell me you're not happy to be here. Uh, anywhere the presence of the Lord is, there's joy. And I'm telling you something. The presence of the Lord is at Hopewell Baptist Church. And any time the word of God is preached in righteousness, it ought to encourage your spirit, feed your spirit, edify your soul, and ought to be happy. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, look at verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner, because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness." All right, so here's what it says. This is the will of God, your sanctification. Abstain from fornication. You should possess your vessel. It says here in verse 4, um, possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Don't ever dishonor your vessel, your body. 
When you dishonor your body, it's not a good thing. It ain't going to make your relationship with God good. Stay away from fornication. Now, there's one other aspect of fornication that I just want to just let you know about. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, but go to Revelation chapter 17. There are two, there are two types of fornication that are mentioned in the Bible. Now, we have just read and discussed in 1 Corinthians 6 and 1 Thessalonians 4 the one kind of fornication. That's what you commit with your body. Okay, so there's a second type of fornication that's mentioned in the Bible, and we're just going to briefly discuss it, but I do want to warn you about it. Revelation chapter 17, we're going to read verses 1 through 5, okay? Are you there? All right, Revelation 17, verse 1, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads, and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. Now, I believe in my heart, I know exactly who this is talking about, and, um, and uh, at any rate, we, we've gone into this um, uh, in the past. You, you look at verse 7, it says, The angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I'll tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that, that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. The beast that, that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth and shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast and, which was and, and is not and yet is. And here's the mind that hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Do you know the city that's sitting on seven hills? The famous city in this world that's sitting on seven hills? Yeah, Rome. That's what's talking about. You know of a, of a particular religious leader that has this golden cup? You know, that's what's talking about. You know, there's, there's one religion on this planet, one place that's prominent in one religion that is recognized as a country. Just one. That's Rome. They have a seat at the table of the League of Nations. The, 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 is it called the League of Nations? Is that United Nations? That one city, Rome, has committed fornication with all the kings of the earth. It's not talking about physical fornication. It's talking about spiritual fornication. And I could go into it and give you great detail about it at a later time. I've done it before in other sermons. But, but here's what this is talking about, spiritual fornication. What is spiritual fornication? It's forsaking the true God and worshiping idols. That's what spiritual fornication is. So here's what God says. Don't walk in these things. Don't walk in fornication. Listen, don't fornicate with your body and don't fornicate in your spirit. Don't be worshiping false gods. Don't worship idols. I'm telling you, if you do these things, these six things, um, you're going to partake in the wrath of God from, that's poured out on the children of disobedience. You're not going to receive an inheritance when you get to heaven. You've been deceived by vain words. Fornication is a big no-no. Physical fornication and spiritual fornication. All right, go back to Ephesians chapter 5, please. Ephesians chapter 5. <sighs> Ephesians chapter number 5. Look down again in verse number three. And by the way, keep a bookmarker or a ribbon or a piece of paper 
in Ephesians 5, because we're going to go back and forth throughout the Scripture as we compare Scripture with Scripture, but we'll always end up back in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 3, it says, But fornication and all uncleanness. Number two, write this down. All uncleanness. So the things that God tells us not to walk in, the first thing is fornication. The second thing is all uncleanness. You say, what is the definition of the word uncleanness? Here's what it is. Moral impurity defilement by sin it is sinfulness that means you're just filled up with sin so all uncleanness moral impurity now we're not talking about sensual sins here you know what part of moral impurity is dishonesty that's moral impurity defrauding people taking advantage of people mistreating people that's all considered moral impurity then the bible tells us all all sin is unclean unclean uncleanness right so uncleanness is defilement by sin okay okay you ever had clothes that were defiled you know what that means to have clothing that's defiled that means they're stained and it's never coming out you know what usually happens when you have clothing that is defiled I just throw it away. Just go buy something new. Just forget it, man. Put a fork in it. It's done. Get rid of it. And there's a lot of, a lot of Christians whose spiritual clothing has been defiled by sin. I mean, it's a stain that's not going away. And that's what this is talking about, all uncleanness. And then sinfulness. It's just like swimming in a pool of sin. That's what all uncleanness is. And God says, don't walk in uncleanness. What usually happens when a person gets their hands dirty? What usually happens? Don't you try to wash it off? Okay, so you're going to commit sin. But the Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So take a spiritual bath every day. Confess your sin to God. Let him clean you up. And, and the Bible says if you want to get close to God, you need to have clean hands. What is that talking about? Don't put your hands in sin and then just let it, that the stain of sin or the dirt of sin just remain on your hands and then try to be close to God. You know, whenever you were a child, a, a parent, and you had a small child that would get dirty and muddy and all that, and they'd come in from the backyard, let's say, I want to give mom a big hug. You're like, ew, clean your hands first, son. And, uh, you know, that's kind of how God is when you want to get close to God he, he says let me see your hands he goes I don't want you touching me with dirty hands now it's simple to get clean just just confess your sins you know you don't need to go swimming in the pool of sin I've often said this if you fall in a mud puddle that happens in life get cleaned don't just sit there and start playing in the mud puddle well, I fell in the mud puddle, so I might as well just splash it all over and just play and it just sitting here and just, let's just have fun in the mud puddle are you listening don't do that. Uncleanness. Don't walk in it. All right, let's look at two passages of Scripture about this. Go to Ezra in the Old Testament. Ezra, chapter number 9. Ezra, right before Nehemiah. Ezra and then Nehemiah, which is before Psalms, a couple of books. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, and Psalms. All right, Ezra, chapter number 9. We're going to read three verses, verses 10, 11, and 12. All right, so let's look at that together, and let's see what the Holy Spirit will minister to our hearts and what the Word of God will teach us about. Ezra, chapter 9, and verse 10, it says, And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments, which... Verse 11, thou hast commanded by thy servants, the prophets, saying, now listen to the statement, the land under which ye go to possess it is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the lands, with their abominations which, they have, uh, which have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness. Now, therefore, give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace or their wealth forever, that ye may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. All right, so here's what God says. 
When the children of Israel, when God gave them the promised land, some of you have maybe never really understood this. Sometimes people look at the Old Testament God and they think, oh, the God of war, what an angry God and the God of wrath and all this bad stuff about God. He murders and kills people and all this stuff in the Old Testament. Well, here's the deal. When God came to the children of Israel and brought them out of Egypt and gave them their freedom, he says, I'm going to give you a land to dwell in. Now, he didn't just go to the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Moabites and just bing, just kick them out and say, get out of here. I want to, I want this to be for my people. No, what happened was all of these people, they filled all of Canaan with uncleanness and filthiness and abominations. And the Bible literally says about them that the land was vomiting them out of the land. They were so filthy and unclean with all the abominations that they participated in as far as how they lived. And God says, it's repulsive to me. I'm kicking you out. So God did not give the Jews the land of Canaan just because he said, hey, I'm just going to find a place for you to live. And whoever's there now, I'm just kicking them out. You know, that's kind of how, that's kind of how some politicians want us to look at our American history. Like we're just a bunch of wicked and vile people and we just came to the land of America and we just get out of the way, all you native uh, inhabitants, and we're just kicking you out. And, I mean, just like we're a bunch of vile, wicked, you know, American Europeans that came over here from, you know, across the sea. But that's not, that's not our history. That, listen to me. You ever heard of the, thank, you know, the first Thanksgiving? I mean, come on now. We, we, a, a lot of the people came here to evangelize the natives to tell them about Jesus and to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ and um, wanting them to be saved and to embrace Christ. You say, well, why didn't we just leave them alone? Because if we did, they probably would have gone straight to hell. You can't worship a false god and go to heaven. You understand that, don't you? God loved them. He loves every person on this planet. And God has commissioned us to carry the gospel to the world so that the world could be saved. I refuse to believe what the politicians say about them, the heritage of our country, that we're nothing but a bunch of wicked, uh, ungrateful, vile Europeans that came here and, and raped and pillaged and kicked out. And, and uh, you can believe what you want, but I refuse to believe that. I believe that most of the people that came over were good-hearted Christian men and women that wanted a place to worship God but also wanted to tell whoever lived here about the love of Jesus Christ and help them to come into the family of God and 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 you know I believe that's the majority of our foundation as a country and that's why God's blessed why would God bless America if we were vile raping and pillaging and abusing and and defiling the people that were here why would God bless that God wouldn't bless that he wouldn't bless it at all. But in this particular passage of Scripture, you say, why did God kick the Canaanites out and brought Israel in? Because they were filthy, defiled, abominations. And it says here, now therefore don't give your daughters unto their sons or take their daughters unto your sons. Don't seek peace with them and don't seek their wealth because I want to bless you and I want to give you wealth and I want to give you peace. But if you live in the abominations of the people that Here's what he said. If you live in the abominations of the people that lived here before you, he goes, the land will vomit you out. And that's exactly what happened in Israel's history with the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. The land vomited them out. Okay? Now, let's look at one more passage about uncleanness. Look over at Romans chapter number 1. By the way, with all of, with all of America's ills, we had a godly heritage. We did. And I, you better not believe a politician over the word of God and over your preacher. You know what? You know, say, how can you tell when a politician is lying if their lips are moving? <laughs> no, I know there are some good politicians, but they are uh, few and far between politicians that are good. And there are some good ones, but they are few and far between. All right, look at Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 24. <laughs> We're going to read verse 24 down to verse 32. It says this, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness 
through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature and likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant, uh, covenant breakers, excuse me, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. We see here in Romans chapter 1 that God talks about a list of unclean activity. It starts with, it starts with, with what we call homosexuality and lesbianism, but God says it's unnatural. It's unnatural behavior. There, look, there is nothing natural about homosexuality. It is filthy, wicked, abominable, disgusting, and repulsive in the eyes of God. That's what it is. Now, you, God made them that way. You're, you're, man, you, you got a hole in your head big enough to drive 10 semi-trucks through. God never made someone to be unclean. God never made anybody to have filthy desires. It's a distortion of the purity that God gave to mankind. And then it goes on to say, likewise, the men. So the women are doing it. Now the men are doing it. And then here's what God says. You're so unclean and filthy and wicked in your, in your lifestyle. I'm going to give you over to a reprobate mind. And by the way, every single person who engages in a lifestyle like this, they have been given over to a reprobate mind. Every one of them. Now, it doesn't mean they're lost and going to hell. You're only lost and going to hell if you reject Christ as your Savior. But you can have a reprobate mind and be a child of God. You really can. And that's a sermon for another day. But let's go on. And it says, now that they've been given over to this reprobate mind, here's all the uncleanness that they live in. Uh, unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable and unmerciful. This is a, a list of all the things that God calls uncleanness. And when you live in these moral impurities, when you defile yourself by these sins, when you commit these sins and you're not asking God to forgive you and to cleanse you, but you just jump in the pool and now it's sinfulness, God says, you are now an unclean person and you will not get an inheritance when you get to heaven. You are gonna be participating with these children of disobedience and the wrath of God is gonna go, go on them but it's gonna overflow onto you. God never intended to pour his wrath on his children but you're gonna feel the effect of it because you're participating in it. The third thing, go down to Ephesians chapter five again. <laughs> In verse number three, the third thing that God tells us to not walk in is found, look at verse number three. It says this, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness. Write down the word covetousness. Are you listening? The word covetousness is defined by this. Ready? A strong desire to obtain an un lawful possession a strong desire to obtain an unlawful possession here's also what it means excessive want or desire excessive that's why god says they that will be rich fall fall 
You know what? If God lets you be rich, that's okay. But if you crave it, you are going to fall as a Christian. Every single Christian that has a desire in their heart to be rich, every one of them falls somehow, some way. You're going to, and it lists it there in 1 Timothy, right? So you better stay away from covetousness. One of the best ways to stay away from covetousness is be happy with what you have. Want what you have, therefore you will have what you want. The Bible says, having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. God even says, if you don't even have a home to live in, if you have food to eat and clothes on your body, be happy. Don't be covetousness. Don't have covetousness. Now, let's look at two passages. Look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. You know, having nice things is okay. You just better not covet it. You better not let your happiness be determined on whether or not you have nice things. If you have nice things from God, that's okay. That's not a bad thing. God's given my wife and I and our family a nice house. We, we did have nice vehicles until my transmission went out in my fix or repair daily truck. And so uh, it's in the shop right now, and praise the Lord, $5,500 later, I'll get it out and it'll be fixed. But anyway, uh, but to have nice vehicles is okay. I mean, that, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. To have nice possessions is okay. The problem is covetousness. Look at Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. Luke chapter 12 and verse 15, and he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not of the abundance of the things that which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no more room wherewith to bestow my fruits. Did he think about giving to the poor? Are you listening? Did he think about uh, giving to God and his kingdom and helping? No. He said, and he said, this will I, do, uh, will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. That's called an abundance of a savings account. Not, again, savings accounts are not bad. But here's what he's saying. I've got all this to, to take care of me for many years. Now watch this. Uh, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night, not many years later, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You know what God is saying? You better stop your covetous behavior. You have no idea when you're going to die, and you may die tonight. So here you go, living your life with all this covetousness of things, and you may not ever be able to enjoy those things. You may not ever be able to spend all that money because it may be that you die tonight. So you better not be a covetous person. In fact, here's what God says. A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Your life is not wrapped up in all that you possess. Stop coveting it. Don't want money. Don't want it. If it comes, great. But don't live your life wanting it. The Bible tells us in Proverbs, um, uh, it, it says, D desire not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. See, our own wisdom is if I get rich, my life will be better. No, if you they are in God's will, your life will be better. If you're in God's will. You know, Paul learned, whatsoever state I am in, therewith to be content. He says, if, I'm, if I have or have not, I can be content. If I'm full or hungry, I can be content. If I have clothes or if I'm naked, I can be content. Whatever state I am in, therewith to be content. Why? Because he was in the will of God. That's what you should desire. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. <sighs> Hebrews chapter 13. You know why people that are Christians often are covetous in their life? It's because they never grow up. They're just a kid. You know what a kid wants? He sees a toy. He wants it. That's a kid. Mine. I want it. I want to play. That's a kid. Many, many adult Christians are just kids inside. They never grow up. Don't want toys. To make yourself feel like your life will be better. 
No. Look, look at Hebrews chapter 13. Look at verse number, number five. Ready? Hebrews 13, verse five. Let your conversation be, ready? Without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have for he hath said i will never leave thee nor forsake thee you know what we use that verse for eternal security and eternal security is taught in that verse but here's what he says the primary application is this would you stop coveting things he said if you have god you have all that you need let your conversation, your lifestyle be without covetousness. And then he says, be content with such things as you have. Why? Because Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. If you have Jesus with you the rest of your life, you have all that you need. Stop coveting other things. Be content with the place that you live. Be content with the car that you drive. Be content with the clothes that you have. Be content with the possessions that you own. If God gives you better possessions, better houses, better cars in the future, fine. If not, still be happy. Still be happy because Jesus will never leave you. All right? So the first three things that we've learned in Ephesians 5 that we're not supposed to walk in is fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. Now, go back to Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll look at the next verse, verse 4, and it'll give us the final three things. It says, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Okay, what are these things? First of all, number four, write down the word filthiness. The word filthiness. What is Filthiness, here's what it is. It is foul, dirty, and corrupt. Foul, dirty, and corrupt. Now, let's look at three passages that kind of give us explanation of filthiness. Look at Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter number 30, please. Go to Proverbs chapter 30, and let's read one verse, verse number 12. Now, watch this. Proverbs chapter 30, verse number 12, it simply says this, there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. I believe the generation that we live in right now, are you listening? 2022, that's what this is talking about. There is a generation, they're pure in their own eyes, but God says you're filthy. You've never been washed from your filthiness. You're pure in your own eyes, and that's not real purity. Real purity is being pure in God's eyes. That's real purity. So don't be a part of that generation that you think you're pure, but you're really filthy. Look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians, please, chapter number 7. We're going to look down at verse number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. Look down at verse number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You know what God says? There are so many promises in this book. Why don't you stop living a filthy life and embrace the promises of God and perfect holiness in the fear of God? He says all these promises are for you. Don't live filthy. Don't live filthy. One last verse. James chapter 1. James chapter number 1. James is right after the book of Hebrews. James chapter 1. We're going to read one verse, verse number 21. All right? This will be the last verse that we read on the topic of filthiness. James chapter 1. Look at verse 21. Ready? James chapter 1, verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. See, preacher, how can I clean my life up of filthiness? Receive the word of God. Every time you come to church and I preach, you receive it. Every time you read the Bible on your own, you receive it. Why? Because it's the word of God that's going to keep you from a life of filthiness. That's what it says. Lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. You know what? There is no award when you get to heaven for being a naughty Christian. Ooh, I got away with something naughty. 
Uh, God says, "Uh uh-uh, you're not getting a reward, an honor, a badge, a trophy. All these children that try to get away with stuff from their parents. That's the definition of naughtiness. Ooh, mom and dad's not looking. I'm going to do what I want. Usually what you want is wrong. That's being naughty. God says, stop that stuff. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Look at the Bible and say, the Bible, tell me how to live. Tell me how to live. The Bible says, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. I said, number one, the first thing we're not supposed to walk in is fornication. The second thing is all uncleanness. Third thing is covetousness. Fourth thing is filthiness. The fifth thing, we're almost done. Ephesians 5, look at verse 4. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking. All right, sit up straight, pay attention, and let me help you this evening. Write down the number five, foolish talking. Foolish talking. What is foolish talking? Here's what it is. It's vain, unwise, meaningless conversation. It is conversation that is without discretion, without regard to God and his word. I I know I said a lot. I'll say it again. Foolish talking is defined as this, vain talking, unwise talking, meaningless conversation. It is conversation that is without discretion. It is also conversation that is without regard to God and his word. That's foolish talking. Stop talking foolishly if you want God to bless you. Let's look at just one verse along this line. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. We're only going to look at one verse. In fact, this is the last reference we're going to look at, and then we're going to come back to Ephesians 5 and wrap this sermon up. Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. All right? Once you find it, look down at verses 12, 13, and 14. Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. Look at verses 12, 13, and 14. Ready? Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 12. It says, The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is is mischievous madness. That's these fools that say, it's okay to drink alcohol as long as you don't get drunk. Man, you're stinking mad. You're out of your mind. What in the world is wrong with you? All this foolish talking. You don't have to go to church to pray. Uh, What? Where would you come up with that? That's foolishness. That's that's, uh, mischievous madness. It says in verse 14, a fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what he shall be, or, or a man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him. Who can tell him? He's just full of words. He's just talking about all this foolishness, this, this uh, um, mischievous madness. And, and God says, stop talking foolishly. Listen, we think we know. You know, we think we know. We say things like, well, that's just not my conviction. Who really cares? It's, who cares? Is it God's conviction? That's what you should care about. The Bible says proving what is acceptable to the Lord. Stop saying, I don't see anything wrong with smoking cigarettes. Stop saying, I don't see anything wrong with going to the movie house. Stop saying, I don't see anything wrong with, with the clothes that I wear. Stop saying, I don't see anything wrong with the music I listen to. Stop it. That's nonsense. That's foolish talking. And if all you try to do is open up your mouth and say words that justify what you're doing, that is mischievous madness. The Bible says we ought to say, if the Lord will, we'll do this and that. If it's the Lord's will. Well, how do I know what the Lord's will is? He gave us a book to tell us. Start talking with this book right here instead of foolishness. Foolish talking is not what God wants us to walk in, all right? So we, now here's number six and last. Go back to Ephesians chapter five, and this is the last verse we're gonna look at. I'm gonna give you the definition of the word. It says in verse four of Ephesians five, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting. The word jesting, write that down. This is number six. When you think of a jester, what do you think of? <sighs> Court jester. What else do you think of with the word? What's the synonym in your mind to the word jester? A clown. Politician. <laughs> no, they're, you know, some of them are evil. They're not, they're not clowns. They're just pure evil. But anyway, uh, some of them are clowns too. But anyway, okay. 
when you think of the word gesture, I think of the word clown. Now, listen this carefully now. Unless you uh, get all concerned about laughter and joking and things like that. Let me tell you what jesting is talking about. By the way, did you know that we just read the only verse in all of the Bible that has the word jesting in it? That's it. That's why we're not going anywhere else. All right, so God says right here, do not have jesting. Okay, what does jesting mean? It means this. Jesting is making fun or light of God and the things of God. That's what he's talking about. Making fun or light, making light of God and the things of God. I believe jesting here is talking about like making light of church. Oh, this is just the playground. No, this is not a playground. This is a, a holy place. The presence of the Lord is here. Why are we making light of church? Why do we look at church and who cares how we behave while we're here? But man, if you're ever going to be on good behavior, it ought to be in church. This is God's house, man. You, would you go to the White House and then just goof around? <laughs> You shouldn't. Now, our president might be doing that right now, but anyway, um, he might not know any better. But anyway, uh, but no, seriously, you, you shouldn't go to places of prominence. You, you wouldn't go to an expensive restaurant. Expensive, like $100, $200 a plate. And just start dropping your silverware everywhere, throwing your napkin on the ground, you know, throwing food at each other, uh, knocking over the, the water glass, and, and just goofing around. Don't make light of God's house. This is God's house. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have fun, or you can't smile, or you can't have joy. I'm talking about jesting, making light of it, making fun of it, of God and the things of God. So, so often, it's, sad, it's saddening in my heart that people just don't respect the house of God sometimes. It's almost like, eh, who cares? It's not my house. It's kind of like the same attitude of junk for Jesus. Hey, honey, are we ever going to use this again? Nope, it's not worth anything. Hey, I know what we can do. Let's take it to the house of God. Let's take it to church and give it to them. You know, that's that attitude, junk for Jesus. When you come to God's house, this is a holy place. I believe with all my heart, parents need to teach their children to respect the house of God. This is the house of, this is God's house. Now, I'm all for having fun. I'm all for enjoying my time here, laughing. I'm all for having joy in my heart. But I'm not going to make fun of God, and I'm not going to make fun of the things of God, and I'm not going to disrespect the property. I'm just, I'm not going to do it. This is God's house. And by the way, soul winning, it's a big deal. When you go soul winning, don't jest. Don't just, oh, la -di -da -di -da -di. oh well, no oh, well, no big deal. No, man, someone's going to go to heaven. Someone's going to escape the fires of hell. This is a big deal. You know, one of the things I try to help our youth pastors over the years to teach our teenagers is to take soul winning seriously. This is not just laughter and games and fun. This is not just times you be on your cell phone while you're knocking on doors. In between doors and stuff, you're, oh, you see this video, oh, ha, ha, all this. No, man, you're supposed to be concentrated on seeing somebody saved. This is a big deal. The ministry, Sunday school, you know, the bus ministry, the nursery, the beginner church, junior church, all of it, it ought to be taken seriously. One of the hardest things I have, I've had in 28 years to convince the workers of our church is whatever ministry you're in, you should treat it as if Jesus was in that ministry that you were ministering to. Jesus, treat your Sunday school class, treat your bus route, treat the nursery, treat beginner church, treat junior church, treat the youth department, treat the Spanish department, treat everything in this church as if you were ministering to Jesus. No jesting. No jesting. Don't make light of the things of God. Don't make light of this book right here. You know, there are some people that never open their Bible and read it, ever. You know why? It's not that important to them. Who cares? It's just the... And then they say silly things. I just don't like to read. I've had people say to me, reading hurts, gives me a headache. 
I've had people say that to me. That's why they don't read their Bible, because every time they read, they get a headache. Okay, okay, let the Bible be read to you on audio app. Does listening to the Bible give you a headache? You see, I don't care what your physical problems are, you can get the Word of God into your mind and into your heart if it's a book that's important to you. Don't make light of the Bible. Don't make light of preaching. Preaching is a big deal to God. The Bible says God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. He's not talking about getting some, an unsaved person saved. He's talking about saving you, Christian, from a life of whatever this world has to offer. The Bible says in, in uh, Acts chapter 2 that Peter, after he told them how to be saved, it says, it goes on to say, with many other words did he uh, 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 say uh, and exhort, save yourselves from this untoward generation. You know what preaching does? If you listen to it, it helps to save yourself from this untoward generation, this wicked world in which we live in. Don't make light of preaching. Don't make light of singing. It hurts my heart. When we're singing the hymns, and I look out in the audience and I see people just talking, not paying attention, not singing, who cares? It's just a song. Let me just say one thing, and I don't want to get mad at you about this, but I do want to help you with this. We've developed a mentality often that the most important part of the church service is preaching, so we don't have to get here on time. We don't have to be here to, for the singing, the announcements, the offering. As long as we get here for the preaching, that's all that matters. Now, I will say, yes, the preaching is the most important part of every church service. But don't tell me the singing of the hymn songs are not important. Please don't tell me that you think announcements are not important. Please don't think that the offering is not important. It's all important. Now, the most important thing is preaching. But all of it is important. Don't make light. Don't make light of congregational singing, the announcements, the offering. It all is important. All of it is. So here's what God says. Now, now we're going to finish. Look at verse number, number five. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Verse, yeah, verse number five. So we just read verses three and four, which says all of these six things, right? Then it says four. That's because of verses three and four. Four, ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So he told these six things, fornication, all uncleanness, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talking, and jesting, and he classifies it in three categories. Whoremonger, unclean person, covetous man. So if you're a fornicator or an unclean person or, 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 or participate in all uncleanness, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talking and jesting, God classifies you as a whoremonger or an unclean person or a covetous man. And here's what he says. You will not have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. This is a big deal. This is a huge deal. God tells us, walk not in these things. And you will be so glad that you listen to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. Thank you, Lord, for each and every person that took time to come to church tonight. Thank you for those who had an open heart and a ready mind. And Lord, I just pray, dear God, do something in our midst that only you can do. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. As always, if you're here tonight and you need to be saved or you need to be baptized, please make those decisions tonight. This is the night. This is the night to make those decisions. But if you're already saved and you've already been baptized, did God speak to your heart tonight about these things that we talked about? Would you